My name is Mike Lawrence, lead pastor, one church, two campuses, right? Framingham and Hopkinton, and I would love to say, yes, I would love to say that. Thank you. You beat me to the punch. How's that? Man, I set that up for you. I'm so excited. We've been, you heard Dan talk about Christmas Eve services. The team planned out, we plotted out the Christmas Eve service of the day, and I'm so excited. If you like trans-Siberian style music, if you want to hear the exciting uh, quantity of shoes and lives that have been touched by that, if you want to hear a stirring message by an inspiring speaker who is very profound... <laughs> If you want to have a tender moment around a tree at either campus, singing Silent Night together, keeping your children from letting one another's clothes on fire, if you want to have all that bundled up together with free chocolate, you should come. <laughs> I'm, I'm just loving it. I've been inviting people all month to come to this. You know, it's so exciting for me that I get to invite my friends to have this moment where they can just recenter on Jesus. And for many of the people that I've been inviting, it's an opportunity for them to to center on Jesus. Something they just don't do, but have the chance that we get to help them do that this Christmas. So I hope you're joining me and in inviting people to come. It'd be wonderful that we'd have all these people just looking at Christ and the wonder of Jesus Christ this Christmas season. Join us in that. Question for the crowd. Favorite Christmas TV special or movie called Dibs on Charlie Brown? Ah, uh, beat you to it. Ah, see, you just got. What can I say? What else? What? Elf. elf. Watch that yesterday. My daughter married a man who is elf. <laughs> right? He is. Someone else. It's a wonderful life. Yes, yeah, a black and white Jimmy Stewart. Right? Gotta love that. Anyone else? Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. Wow, we're going back on it. What? What is it? Rudolph. Yes, okay. that was on last night. Right? Cool. Anyone else? White, White Christmas Die Hard. <laughs> yes, that is a Christmas movie, isn't it? Yes. Bruce Willis, your favorite action Christmas hero. Anyone else? Home Alone. I love who said Home Alone. You're my favorite person today. Home Alone 1 or 2. Both. All right. I'll take that. Home Alone 2. I laugh so hard, I cry every single time. And there's, there is one Christmas movie that my family says exemplifies me. I'm personified in the movie. Any idea what that might be? No. She is still my favorite person. Christmas Vacation. With the lights, right? We love these movies. We often love them because they have these warm, sentimental feel about them, right? Family and values and peace and relationship and some joy in the midst of all that. It's kind of what we love about the holidays. But you know what's amazing to me is life doesn't always feel like that, does it? I'm seeing the last couple of weeks. Is you have this horrific act of terrorism on an American Air Force base. You know, Congress embroiled in an impeachment process for the president. We have two superpowers playing chicken with the global economy. And we think about 2020, we're looking at that year as kind of a, hey, a new decade, oh, and a presidential election that just seems to promise it's going to be unsettling at best, if not creating anxiety. And I didn't even mention anything like immigration struggles, gun violence, tensions over racism. Sometimes we look and we see this promise from the angels we talked about just last week, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those with whom God is, feel, God is pleased. But it doesn't feel peaceful. And we're living in a world, a conflicted world. When we're talking to our friends at Christmas time, we'll often look at them and like, why do you bother going to church? What is it about Christmas that just makes you feel joy when you just turn on the news like that? This morning, I want to talk about how to find peace in a conflicted world. And to do that, I really want to talk about the struggles we're facing in this world, the kind of leader we need to face those, and the nation that brings true peace. That's a pretty heavy load. So join me in this this morning, because I promise that in the midst of this, by the time we end, there'll be answers to those things. God, thank you that we get to come into this place. Thank you, Lord, that the peace that we find is a, comes from a promise that you've given 
And this morning, I pray that you would lead us to that peace. I pray that you would speak through me, that your words coming through me would bring peace to the souls of people in this room. I believe that you exist. I believe that you hear prayers, and I believe that you answer them. And I believe that you want everyone in this room to discover the peace that is available through relationship with you. God, as we've been praying, be the shepherd that guides us to that place. I love you, and I trust you at this moment. You're my father. Amen. So this whole idea of living in a world that's kind of caught with a conflict and with violence isn't new to our generation. If you read the Bible, if you've ever in your lifetime read the Bible cover to cover, and I've done that a number of times, what you, describe, what you find described in our history is often marked by conflict and violence. It just seems to be the way of life for human beings. And the Bible doesn't shy away from that. The Bible talks about how to find peace and love and relationships in the midst of that. You know, we've been untangling some promises that God had made 700 years before Jesus had been born. That was an indicator of God's plan through the life and work of Jesus Christ. And when the promises that God's given were often connected to two individuals, or at least the ones we're talking about at Christmas time, a man named Isaiah and a man named Micah. Their, their works are in our Bible in, a, in individual books that bear their names. So it's quite remarkable that God would give these type of promises that we've been studying when you know the times in which they lived. Sometimes it's really important to go back to understand the world's in which these authors lived because they bring new meaning and insight to the promises or into the teachings or into just the words that they have. Because Isaiah and Micah lived in some pretty difficult times. They lived in a time of incredible political turmoil, especially Isaiah. Isaiah had seen kings come and go. Some of them were remarkable individuals that were great examples to follow. Some of them just led the whole nation to moral decay and made some really bad foreign policy decisions. Some of them had produced an uneven economy. He had lived through a period where there were times of prosperity and then times when the whole economy just plunged and people suffered because of that. They lived during times of unstable religious leadership with people that they were supposed to be able to trust made decisions that undermined their integrity. They also lived with some great examples that were worth following. They had pressure around them from the countries that just touched their borders. They found that if they didn't cooperate the way they wanted to, life got difficult, violence would increase, and tension would mark their world. They lived in a fear of terror. There were powerful nations that coerced them with their power, forcing them into treaties that benefited the foreign powers more than it benefited them. The suffering that they felt was really difficult. Matter of fact, Isaiah records a time when one of those nations came right up to the edges of their cities. These times were so bad that the capitals were surrounded by powerful walls to try to protect them. And a vast army came right up to the wall, the capital of, of uh, Judah at that time, Jerusalem. And every day, they used to send out people to mock the individuals on the other side of the wall. They even sent out uh, political leaders. Once the whole nation, or the people in the capital, gathered on the walls as the army was out on the fields right outside, and he began to mock God. He began to mock their king. He began to mock their choices. These were the world in which Isaiah and Micah lived. Political turmoil, an uneven economy, unstable religious leaders, frightening foreign affairs, and violent times. It sounds like CNN. <laughs> right? And you just think, I just read the evening news. You gotta put yourself into that place to understand these promises. These are not people who kind of uh, approach life in a Pollyanna way with rose-colored glasses. These are people who lived under very difficult circumstances. And yet God spoke to them about promises for a future that he was designing. I want to take us through one of the promises that Isaiah records to share with people. Put it into that context and always remember the world in which he lived. It's a promise we often go to at Christmas time. It's pretty interesting. It starts off like this. The people who walked in darkness has seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. Darkness was a way of discovering their world. We still use it today. I'm in a dark mood. I'm living in darkness. 
We use it to describe things like despair and depression and hopelessness. When things are difficult and our world feels dark. We talk about that for our world. I often say it's to the teens whenever I get to speak to them, because I think if you are under 30, you're living in a world that is dark. It's not surprising that issues of anxiety and depression and insecurity are on the rise among young adults, teenagers, and kids. Because think of the world in which they live. They have only known an American nation at war for an event they can barely remember, 9-11. There are soldiers on the field of battle who cannot recall ever seeing 9-11 happen. But they're fighting the war for it. They've seen terrorism from foreign powers that give them insecurity. They live in fear of domestic violence. Some of them are afraid to go to movie theaters, concerts, right? Even afraid to go to church. There's an anxiety that they feel whenever a crowd is gathered at the back of their mind, is somebody going to show up with a gun? They wrestle on the weight of environmental concerns, crushing college debt, and seemingly unsolvable social issues like, like racism. Their world feels dark. It's hard to be young. It's probably the generation with the most difficulty since World War II. So their world feels like this. When we read the people who have walked in darkness, we're talking about times like today. But to that world, under those circumstances, God breaks in with light because light seems to shine the brightest when it's the darkest. And what God is saying through Isaiah is, I understand that your world feels dark, but I want you to know that I have a plan. Your world is not hopeless. I have not turned my back on it, but I am doing a work, Isaiah, that's going to change the world. He described it to Isaiah using imagery that they would understand that we have to figure out. Because when Isaiah used these words that I'm about to read, the world would understand exactly how they were supposed to feel about this promise. You multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as, as with joy at the harvest, as they're glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. It's hard for us to get our heads around this, but what he's trying to say to us is the promise that I'm bringing, the work that I'm doing, will bring people joy like when a farmer has a bumper crop. Like when, like when a slave has their chains removed and they're given freedom. Like it would feel if all the soldiers came off to feel the battle having won, peace was finally solidified, and they could burn their uniforms because they're not going to need them anymore. That's the joy you're supposed to feel. That's what will happen when my plan comes to fruition, God is saying. I want to fill the world with a joy where all your needs are met with bounty, where a peace brings end to war, where freedom comes, where joy replaces fear, and where comfort takes the place of grief. That's the plan that God has come to do. And he describes he's going to do that because he's going to be bringing into the world a very remarkable leader. Because the world needed a leader. And so God says, I've sent the leader. For there was a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. God is saying, I'm bringing a government leader that's going to enter into this world. Because every leader starts the same way as a baby. They look fragile, they look weak, but they grow into have incredible influence and power that were going to influence affairs around them. This joy of this time of freedom, joy, and peace was coming because God was going to send a child into the world who would become a great leader of a vast government that would bring the world to peace. And then God goes on to describe this child. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It was a habit of the ancient world that they would give a name to the child of the destiny of that child, the character they hoped that child would have, and the work that they wanted this child to achieve in his or her life. And so they would give the child names. It was really weird because the names are often phrases 
but they were meant to mark their destiny. And so God's describing someone to bring a peace into a world of great trouble by calling him a wonderful counselor. A wonderful counselor, an individual whose plans, whose counsel was marked with wonderful wisdom, who had achieved something greater than what they could imagine because of the brilliance of his strategy and his approach. He went on to describe this child as a prince of peace, someone from royal heritage whose reign, whose realm would bring peace to the world around them. But then it gets a little funky after this because he also uses a couple of phrases which would have been really difficult for Isaiah to understand, never mind the people. He uses this. This child is going to be called everlasting father. Okay, we kind of get it. You're talking about somebody who would kind of love the nation like a father would love the children, have the care and the concern to protect the children and to provide provision, but to use the word everlasting would never not make sense to them because no one was everlasting. It was a word of eternity. Basically, he's saying this is a rule that wouldn't die, but that would be confusing to them because that doesn't make sense that there would be that type of leader in the world. And then he he calls this person Mighty God. I gotta tell you something. People who write books about the Bible struggle with this. Someone's saying, well, somebody who's mighty, who has the might of God, like a warrior with God's power. But then there are other commentators who say that just doesn't make sense because when you read that exact phrase used by Isaiah in other areas of the Bible, it's a phrase about God. He's saying this person would be a mighty God. Now, the other nations around them, they believed their leaders were gods. Matter of fact, when you get to the time of Jesus, they believed that Caesar was the son of God. Uh, Two of my kids and I, over Thanksgiving, we went into the Museum of Fine Arts. We went through the Egyptian Center. We saw the, the, the display on Nubia. They believed their pharaohs were gods on earth. Israel never thought that. Never. It was a moral and spiritual affront to them that leaders would be associated with God. Because it was only one God. The description of this child was unique, unlike any other description that had ever been given to a government leader. And they were wrestling with, well, what is it? It's an extraordinary description of a child with great destiny from character that would do an incredible work. Isaiah would go on to say, of the increase of his government and of peace, there'll be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice, with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What he's saying about this individual that was coming to the world, this government leader that's coming to the world, they're going to have a powerful effect in establishing a government that would take over the world and never cease. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because in Isaiah's day, their country had diminished in its impact and its power, its influence, and their people felt insecure and threatened and unstable. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had a person who came into our world who could establish a government with a never-ending peace, a person whose reign or rule would be marked by justice with a character that would be exemplary, who'd actually have a religious background that we could trust. That's what they were looking for, But they couldn't find it. Because in Isaiah's day, they had good leaders, bad leaders. They came and go so frequently, they couldn't understand this promise. But isn't it what we want? Wouldn't you love to go into 2020 with a candidate that you could trust their moral character? You could trust the statements they make about God. You could believe that they could bring peace to the world. You'd believe that they could institute justice. Wouldn't you love that? That's what they wanted. It's the same desire separated by a few thousand years. Which is a clue to us. The same desire we we feel for thousands of years. Now what's really funny is that we find the promises from Isaiah quoted in the Christmas stories. We've been looking at right? And this promise is referenced in the life of Jesus but not in the Christmas story. It actually comes to us at a real interesting time in the life of Jesus. You see, it comes to us at a time at the very beginning of Jesus' work 
after he had faced off in the desert against Satan. When Jesus had emerged victorious from a desert wilderness, having faced off against e- evil, having kept his integrity and his commitment to God, he burst onto the scene with his very first act of ministry. Matthew, one of the four leaders from the four authors who wrote the story of Jesus, would quote from this saying, This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who live in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. Matthew pulls back to this quote. And it was a trick. It was a trick. If you know how to read the uh, scriptures from an ancient perspective, when they quoted a little bit of a promise, it was meant to be a signpost to the whole promise. It was kind of like a big sign on the highway, take this exit. And what they're trying to say by quoting the very beginning of this promise is that the whole promise has been fulfilled. And Matthew had an aha moment. They were living under Roman rule, under the peace of Rome that came from a sword, from a foreign power that had come. And people of his day were violently trying to overthrow the government. They hated the people that were in charge. They wanted a new leader. They wanted a time of peace to come to their world. They wanted their government to get their act in order and to take over and to be what it was supposed to be to the world. And Matthew had this aha moment. It was Jesus. Jesus was the leader that Isaiah talked about 700 years ago. Jesus was the child that had come into this world. And Jesus was the one who was to bring about a change that was going to impact the whole world. His plans. And Matthew, now think about this. Matthew was trained by Jesus. And what he experienced in the life of Jesus, I mean, he wrote his work about Jesus after Jesus had done everything. And so he inserted these promises about God into the story of Jesus because he began to realize that Jesus was the fulfillment of these things. And what he saw in Jesus was a wonderful counselor, somebody whose plans were God's plans, backed by truly wonderful moments that we call miracles, that the plan that Jesus had come to bring to the world was filled with wonder. He began to see in the life of Jesus Someone who was a mighty God. Not someone who had the, just the power of God, but the character of God and the power of God. He saw in Jesus somebody who was everlasting, who brought the love of the Father into the world. It was Jesus who taught him to pray to God as a father, who knew God like a father, and who had an eternal nature. It was Jesus Christ who was a prince of peace. He was a descendant of one of their greatest kings, David. And he had come to bring peace into the world. And there was some confusion about Jesus because some people were worried that Jesus was going to create a great revolution that was going to take over and establish a new government. Because what do we look for? We look for peace through the government and through human leaders. And when we don't get that, we feel fearful and insecure. Anxiety rises because we put our trust in political systems and in leaders. And I'll tell you, politics are important. I've been to nations that have taught me that because of the oppression they feel from their government. And I feel that leaders are important because I've been to nations where people are fearful of their leaders. But Matthew had a point to make because the message that Jesus started to teach from the beginning of his ministry was this. It follows right after this promise from Isaiah. And Jesus enters into and says, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Matthew went, that's the kingdom. It's not a political system. Because political systems rise and fall. Leaders come and go. But the, the system that God came to bring into this world was called the kingdom of heaven. It was a phrase that Matthew loves to use in his story of the life of Jesus. He's always referencing the kingdom of heaven. It's a, and when Luke would talk about it, Luke called it the kingdom of God because he was writing to people who weren't Jews. And he wanted them, both of them wanted the world to understand that a new order had come. It was a phrase, it was like a metaphor to them. It wasn't a political order. It wasn't political leaders. It was God had entered into the world with a new plan through a new leader who had come to establish something that was like a kingdom, like a nation. 
You know, we talk about like sheep in God's fold, or we talk about like children in God's family. It's being like a citizen in God's nation. God had come to introduce a peace that was greater than anything that human beings could legislate, establish, or bring. It was a peace that would transcend the troubles of the world and push past cultural barriers and into countries with different, with different politics and different governments and different orders. And Jesus knew this. Jesus himself said to us, I have told you these things so that in me you may find peace. In me you may find peace. Right? In the world you're just gonna have trouble. In the world you're gonna have domestic violence. In the world you're gonna have terrorism. In the world you're gonna see your finances rise and fall. In the world you're gonna have leaders come and go. In the world, you're going to have governments that are going to be run by despots. In the world, you're going to have religious leaders that you can't trust. But in me, Jesus says, you will have peace. I have overcome the world. And the power of that, Jesus didn't overcome the world with military. Jesus didn't overcome the world through new legislation and new governments. Jesus overcame the world with love. Jesus overcame the world through the cross. And suddenly the work of Jesus Christ transcends any nation, any government. And I've been to places, look at, I am old enough that I've been in the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union. Under nations that were forced underneath that rule. And I saw the church prosper there. When China in the beginning of the 1900s kicked all of the foreigners out, which meant all the missionaries that had been there trying to help the church in China grow, the world was afraid of that the church would die. And when finally the Great Wall of China opened up and people could go into China, you know what they discovered in China? The church thriving. When the Soviet Union fell, you know what they discovered in the Soviet Union? The church thriving. When they've went into some of the poorest places, when I've been in some of the poorest places I could imagine in Africa, you know what I discovered? The church thriving. And in the rise and fall of political leaders in America, and all the changes that we've experienced, we are worshiping God in a 300-year-old church that is older than the United States. Because the peace that God has come to offer transcends people transcends governments. It transcends all orders. It's wrapped around the world. The only transcendent peace you'll find is through Jesus Christ, a wonderful counselor who has a plan for your life and to fill it with miracles. The only peace that you can find is through Jesus Christ, the mighty God who conquered death and the grave. The only peace that you can find is through Jesus Christ, the eternal Jesus Christ who leads you to a heavenly father to experience the love of God. The only peace you can know is from Jesus Christ who has overcome the world. It's no wonder that the early church leaders, when they thought of Jesus Christ, they say he is above all power and authority. He transcends it and stands above it and he brings into this world a peace. We really do live in disturbing times. Isn't it disheartening that in the last 20 years we have had two presidents impeached? from both political parties, by both political parties. We're living in a world that it feels unstable, an unprecedented rise in gun violence, a resurgence of racial tension, an unstable economy, and the promise of a divisive election year. Here's the thing. You'll never find peace from those people. You'll never find peace from a human being. The only peace that we can discover is from the God who transcends culture and time who is working out a plan through Jesus Christ to reach a world with his love and peace. You know, I don't know, again, I don't know why you're in the room this morning, and I don't know what the situation is that you're experiencing, but I know this, you can find peace through God, through Jesus Christ, who transcends the troubles of this world, who enters into your troubles, not always to lift you out of them, but to empower you into the midst of them. Because you know what peace, where peace really comes from? A peaceful heart. When we come to peace with God ourselves, that peace enters into our lives. And then it 
radiates into our relationships. As it radiates into our relationships, it moves outward through those relationships into whole communities. And as it moves in through communities, it moves in through the states and in through the countries. Peace has always come when a religious movement trans pulls together to find peace through God. And then it moves around the world. As Christians, we should be the most stable and most peaceful citizens in the United States. Because we're not putting our faith in our leaders, though we pray for them. We're not putting our faith in the government system, though it's a great one. We're putting our peace in a God who is greater than all those things. And so the peace that we have from God is a peace that the world seeks and follows. They should be looking to us and turning to us for direction. And in 2020, in the midst of the promise of all the instability that the world has around it and all the trouble of the world, they should be looking to us and they should say, how can you be so peaceful at a time like this? It comes through God. It's at a time like this that in our worship, because this is what I love about Christmas. I mean, I get anxious when I listen to the news sometimes, and fear sometimes will strike me. But what I love about Christmas time is these moments when suddenly a song comes out. And it reminds me of the power and the love and the peace that comes from God. And it calls me to recenter my thoughts, not on the news that I'm hearing, though I pray for it, but on the God above those things who can bring hope and peace and love into that through his people. And that's where I find peace, even at Christmas time.